Hello and welcome to Capital Market Live on Channels Television. I'm Will Ibang and as always, let's check in on the markets. We begin with Europe where stocks closed low on Friday as investors reacted to the European Central Bank's latest policy decisions and a hotter than expected U.S. inflation report. Major markets recorded double-digit losses. Frank SCAC 40 fell 2.69%. The German DAX dropped 3.08% while the U.K.'s FTSE 100 declined by 2.12%. The ECB on Thursday confirmed its intention to hike interest rates by 25 basis points at its July meeting with a further hike expected in September, the scale of which will be determined by the medium-term inflation outlook. Now, shares in Asia-Pacific were mixed on Friday as Chinese inflation data for May came in largely in line with expectations. Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index slipped 0.29% to close at 21,806.18 points. Hong Kong listed shares of Alibaba turned around, the closing 1.35% higher after falling nearly 4% earlier. In mainland China, the Shanghai Composite gained 1.42% to close, while the Shenzhen component jumped 1.9%. Japan's Nikkei 225 shed 1.49%, as shares of SoftBank Group dropped 2.01%. Now, in the U.S., stocks dropped on Friday after a highly anticipated inflation report showed a faster-than-expected rise in prices and consumer sentiment hit a record low. The Dow Jones Industrial Average dropped 2.5 percent. The S&P 500 fell 2.7 percent, while the Nasdaq Composite sank more than 3 percent. Tech stocks were under pressure as investors grappled with higher rates and a potential recession. Shares of Netflix dropped nearly 5 percent, following a downgrade from Goldman Sachs. Cheap giant Nvidia slid 6 percent, while the hot inflation readings have flamed concerns about a potential recession for the U.S. economy among investors and the general public. Now back home at the equities market, positive sentiments returned this week as investors took advantage of the moderation in share prices last week to make re-entry into sound companies with attractive dividend yields. The all-share index inched higher by 0.55% week on week to close at 53,201.38 points. Bargain hunting in MTN Nigeria. Union Bank, Lafarge, and Presco drove the weekly gain. Now, Monte Date is back in positive territory. The return is at 0.4%, and the year to date returns for the index increased to 24.5%. However, activity levels were weaker than in the previous week as trading volume and value declined by 93.6% and 90.7% week on week. Performance across sectors was mixed, slightly bearish as the oil and gas and industrial goods indexes closed positive, while the banking, insurance and consumer goods indexes declined. Global Spectrum Energy Services topped the gainers chart for the week, while industrial and medical gases Nigeria led the gainers. The three of FBN Holdings, Transnational Corporation PLC, and UBA contributed 62.08% and 42.7% to the total volume and value traded in the week. Similarly, at the NASD, over-the-counter securities exchange index closed the week on a positive note. The NASD securities index rose by more than 3%. The exchange gained about 3 billion naira in value. Also, volume rose by about 20% to 12.32 million units of shares traded, while value traded for the week rose by over 197% to 272.44 million naira. Friesland Campina Wamco Nigeria led four other gainers for the week, while Central Securities Clearing System was the only loser. Meanwhile, Central Securities Clearing System and City Trust Holdings were among top stocks traded by volume for the week. Now, this week, the Nigerian Exchange Limited said it intends to launch a blockchain-enabled exchange platform next year in order to expand trade and attract new investors. The move follows the Nigerian Securities and Exchange Commission's establishment of the legislation to regulate trade in digital assets, as well as a growing enthusiasm among businesses and policymakers in Africa to implement distributed ledger technology. Joining me from our Abuja studio to discuss this and more is Professor Uche Uwalike, Professor of Capital Market at the Nassau State University and President, Association of Capital Market Academics of Nigeria. Good to speak to you, Prof. Thanks so much, Will. Um, it's indeed my pleasure. 
It's good to always have you, Prof. Now, the NGX says it will embrace blockchain to settle capital market transactions in 2023. That's next year. Going digital is what many have been clamoring for, especially the young people. However, will it mean the end of stockbroking firms since blockchain technology offers a secure way for individuals, you know, to deal directly with others that's peer-to-peer -peer without intermediaries like the government, bank, other third parties? What's your take on this, Prof? Well, I start by saying it's a welcome development um, in the sense that um, it will bring about uh, speed, um, speed in the execution of transactions, you know, in the, in the market. Um, as you know, uh, with respect to the equities market, transaction cycle is T plus three. Um, that's um, an average of four days uh, before transactions are concluded. Um, I think with um, the introduction of blockchain technology, you should expect that um, transaction cycle, you know, will um, reduce, uh, which is why I said um, it's indeed a welcome development. And also don't forget that um, uh, a blockchain um, is associated with uh, smart contracts, or if you like, smart contracts associated with, uh, uh, you know, blockchain, uh, which, um, as you know, is uh, simply a program that one can build into the blockchain to enable self-execution. Self so all of that will, you know, contribute to speed, um, particularly in the derivative market where you um, have uh, central counterparties, um, parties that serve as buyers to the seller, um, you know, buyer to every seller or seller to every buyer. So the feature of innovation, what we call innovation uh, in the derivative market, you know, um, may be um, eliminated with, um, you know, blo blockchain. Uh, and as you rightly pointed out, it's something that will attract um, you know, more investors, a lot of youths, you know, uh, given the fact that this is a country with, um, uh, you know, youthful population. I was at an event um, not too long ago um, you know, where the CEO of um, C C Central Securities Clearing System, um, Mr. Harun Adalo Waziri, uh, disclosed that the average um, age of retail investors in the Nigerian cap um, capital market is uh, 53 years. Um, mm. And um, of course, that's high, considering the youthful population of, of the country. But uh, the good news is that that's, that's uh, changing now. Um, if you recall, the MTN offer for sale that was done last year, um, uh, one of the outcomes um, you know, happens to be the fact that about 76% of those that applied you know, through the digital platform, 85% um, of them, you know, according to what we read, you know, happened to be women and um, youths. Uh, youths in particular. So I think this is a very good development. Um, and I must commend the Securities and Exchange Commission, you know, for coming up with um, regulations uh, and rules with respect to crypto assets, respect to um, non-fungible, uh, non-fungible, um, okay. um, um, uh, yes, uh, digital assets, okay. you know, as well. Um, so that will in incentivize them um, a lot of people to go into it. Um, so we expect going forward, we expect to see digital asset exchanges, uh, um, digital asset, um, um, you know, offering platforms, virtual mm -hmm. service, um, virtual asset sub service providers, you know, and, and the rest of them. Um, so I think, of course, the role of stock bro brokers and their uh, capital market um, operators, intermediaries and operators um, will um, reduce, but of course mm -hmm. it will be there. Uh, remember, uh, the, the blockchains are machines. Um, yes, you can call a blockchain a trust machine, just as the economist calls, calls um, blockchain trust machine. Uh, but the human element will, will always be there. Okay. Brokers will always be there to provide them okay. um, advice and um, okay. some other services that they render. Um, okay. um, even if you remove them you know, from the point of um, uh, bringing together, as it were, you know, okay. buyers and sellers, because the trust machine you okay. know, will now be doing all that. But bro okay. bro brokerage will complete will continue to be relevant. Okay, we'll, we'll hope so because a lot, of, a lot of people still have jobs there. So now, but other, let's moving on to the other things that happen in the market, Prof. Now, the stock market witnessed mixed performance this week. The highest drop was on Wednesday, which was the day the ruling party's flag bearer emerged. Would you describe that as the market reaction to the outcome of the APC primaries? <laughs> okay, no, no, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say so. Um, yes, the I noticed. I noticed the market dropped on Wednesday. Um, mm -hmm. I think by about minus zero point one for one four percent. Um, but I don't think it was in a reaction to the outcome of the APC primaries. Um, if you uh, observed, 
Um, the market was already up uh, for the first two trading days of, of the week. Um, um, the all share index had appreciated. And um, recall too that the, the previous week, the, all through the previous week, um, the market was down except for Friday. The market lost about, um, I think, 2.18% the previous week. So um, when it opened on a positive note, um, you know, this week, uh, you know, one wasn't surprised. But Tuesday, we also saw positive sentiment. Uh, so what happened on Wednesday, in my view, was simply profit taking. Um, and um, of course, you also notice that um, all of that reversed by Friday. The market closed on a positive note uh, on Friday, such that week on week, as you rightly reported, mm. the market appreciated by, I think, 0.55%. So yes. I don't think it was in, in reaction to um, you know, the primaries. Uh, we don't, <laughs> our markets are, are, still, are not that efficient in, you know, in terms of um, um, you know, impounding, as it were, uh, information uh, you know, political, that kind of information, um, you know, automatically on share prices. I, I don't think it was a reaction. Okay, still talking about the primaries and what happened uh, on Wednesday. The candidates of the two major parties in particular have uh, released their agenda. Which of them, Prof, do you think is more market friendly? Okay, um, well, if you look at the, the programs that are already in the uh, public space, um, uh, of the two uh, contenders. Let, let me even add the three major contenders. Um, um, the way I would like to see them in relation to the market is um, that of the APC, uh, Bola Med, Tinubu is market friendly. Um, that of uh, the PDP candidates, uh, Malaja Tiku Abubaka, is more market friendly. And that of um, um, the Labour Party, it will be, is most market friendly. Mm. Um, I think I, I will describe it, you know, describe them, you know, that way. Uh, starting with P2B, of course, you know P2B, um, he, he prides himself as a trader, as a successful businessman. Uh, he's um, very much at home with the private sector. But more important, importantly, he understands the capital markets. Um, remember, um, he, was, he used to be the chairman of um, the Securities and Exchange Commission. So um, in terms of market-friendly, I think I rate him the highest. But as I said to um, that of APC um, is market friendly. If you look at uh, some of the things um, the candidate has unveiled so far, uh, a lot of them will have a positive um, impact on the markets, uh, although indirectly. Uh, APC was talking about uh, growing the economy by, uh, you know, 12 percent, uh, GDP growth rate of 12 percent on the average over the next four years. Um, you know, ramping up power di distribution, uh, 15,000 megawatt megawatts of um, electricity. Um, and the, the, he also talked about public-private partnerships. Okay, all of that will rub off positively, no doubt, mm -hmm. you know, on, on the market. And again, in the commodity space, the, uh, um, I, I think Ahmed Tudubu was talking about um, really? setting up a new commodity exchange. Uh, in the boards, exchange yeah. boards. Although I have my reservation there, but that's, that's a subject of, you know, for another, another day. Mm. Uh, that of um, Alaji Atiku Abaka is a lot more explicit in terms of um, what it intends to do that will impact the market, you know, directly. Aside from saying it, it, it intends to um, increase um, income per capita from about $2,000 to $5,000, um, um, increase the manufacturing GDP from about 10% to um, 30%. Okay, it also talks about what to do with infrastructure. You know, it, it says it intends to break the monopoly um, uh, in all infrastructure sectors, um, okay. whether it is um, transport, whether it is um, um, including um, the oil sector. So okay. I, I think for me that's, um, that, that's very instructive. Um, okay. it, it, and but as part of the strategy, he talked about setting up or incentivizing a consortium of firms, you know, to set up and uh, infrastructure development fund, okay? That is very critical for us in, in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. An infrastructure development fund is usually uh, sponsored by, um, you know, banks, or including non-bank non financial institutions, okay. you know, um, and it's an investment vehicle where, if you like, um, um, institutional investors in particular, pension funds, insurance companies, you know, would invest uh, in infrastructure. Okay. Uh, we have one in Nigeria, uh, the one I know of, I know of the Chapel Hill, uh, you know, Denham infrastructure uh, 
debt fund, which has been there, I think, since 2017. So the administration of um, Alaji Atikua Baka is saying that such companies will be encouraged. And I think that's, okay. that's, um, that's a good one. Okay. But my advice to uh, him in terms of um, these programs, um, in terms of the objectives uh, that are there, yes, there are, there are smart, smart objectives. Um, as I'm using SMART now as an acronym. Okay. But the timelines, are, in my view, some of them are, you know, shouldn't exceed 27, okay. 2027. Okay. Okay. Because he talks about doing those these things, some of them, by 2030. And by 2030, of course, um, is um, f the time would have um, um, ended. So okay. I expect that any ob objective should be within the period um, that um, he is staying in office. And okay. of course, for Asiwa Jubala Tunubu, Whatever he said, he said within the next um, uh, four years. And to okay, me, that, that made, a, you know, prof, uh, made we'll a lot take, of sense. Yes. Prof, uh, we'll keep watching that. And we expect that these, uh, like you, you said, the agendas will happen when they are in office. But we'll take a quick break now. And when we return, the conversation continues to stay with us. This is Capital Market. Welcome back. The presidential election primaries was not the only event that appeared to shake the equities market this week. FBN Holdings such shares fell 13.4% to a six-month low on Thursday after its single largest individual shareholder, Femi Otedola, sold down about 834 million of the company's shares in a deal valued at about 9.2 billion naira. Professor Walike is still here with me to talk about this. So, Prof, what do you make of this move? Yeah, yeah, well, sincerely, um, you know, one, one cannot tell the motive for the um, sell down. But of course, if somebody is selling, uh, he needs the money for, for something. Mm -hmm. uh, Nine billion uh, naira is, um, uh, you know, isn't small money. Uh, but, but my, my um, if you like, why, why, why I'm not concerned about that is uh, the fact that uh, you know, due process was followed. Um, the exchange um, uh, was uh, duly notified about that insider um, deal. Um, and um, it didn't really depress the share price of um, First Bank, um, you know, significantly. Um, uh, the share price of First Bank opened, I, I think, at uh, 11.255 Naira on um, Monday. And um, yes, it fell on Wednesday to uh, 10 Naira 30. But we also saw uh, some correction, if you like, uh, by Friday when it had um, appreciated again uh, to 10 Naira um, 55 Kobo. 55 so uh, as I said, we, it, it, we didn't see the, the impact um, uh, on share price of um, First Bank um, in significant terms. So we, are, we are talking about, about I think, two points uh, two two percent um, uh, shares. Uh, you know, if you're looking at the overall outstanding shares of First Bank, First Bank has thirty five point um, um, sorry, close to forty billion uh, um, uh, shares um, outstanding. So thirty five point nine. That's about thirty six billion shares outstanding, and then you have um, um, eight hundred million shares. Um, you know, being sold. So. The point is, due process was followed, and um, it didn't quite depress the share price of First Bank. I, again, that speaks to the resilience of our markets. Um, you know, resilience is one of the um, factors that we use to measure market liquidity. Um, resilience is the ability of the market to self-correct, and um, to a large extent, our market is resilient. The other factors mm. are tightness. Uh, you have um, immediacy. You have debt. You have um, Brett, again, that's, uh, that's not what we're discussing today. Mm. But um, our market is resilient. Mm. And uh, except maybe going further, um, you know, the set pressure visit, I, I don't mm -hmm. think that, um, we're gonna, you know, it's going to have um, any major impact, uh, even on the share price of First, uh, first Bank. Um, if you look okay. at First Bank's 52-week high, uh, First Bank 52-week high at 12 Naira 90, and 52-week uh, low at about, I think, 7 Naira 5 Cobo. Um, mm -hmm. The current share price of uh, 1055 is um, uh, is still, um, you know, uh, a good uh, valuation in my view. 
Okay. Now, the capital market prof is often said to be the barometer for any economy against the backdrop of rising inflation, interest rates, exchange rates, public debt is rising, and uh, tepid GDP growth that we just witnessed. What do you think should be done to mitigate the negative impact on the capital market, especially with the rate of inflation we have now at 16.82%. Uh, we have uh, rising debt, which grew to about 41 trillion naira. And GDP growth was not very encouraging, Prof. So how do we mitigate these factors? Well, well GDP growth rate um, um, is picking up gradually. Um, uh, at least let's, let's admit that, um, even though uh, it's still not um, it's still not very strong, uh, and again, even though in the in the last five quarters um, it's been on the decline. Um, second quarter of 2021, um, it was when it peaked at 5.03%, um, but it came down third quarter, you know, four point, um, and then um, last quarter, and again first quarter of 2022, we have we have also witnessing further decline, but it's still positive above three percent. You know, yes. Um, in terms of um, uh, public debt, yes, that's worrisome. Um, over 41 trillion now um, in Naira. I think one of the things that um, you know should be done uh, would be to um, first, in my view, uh, uh, put a lead on borrowing. Um, mm -hmm. Secondly, even if we must borrow, then we borrow um, right. Um, if you look at the program of um, Alaja Atikwa Abubakar, for example, it, it was that was why I said. Um, that also is market friendly. He was talking about, you know, uh, using project tied loans. So every loan you're taking must be project tied. And he was also talking about using um, uh, more of Sukuk. Uh, Sukuk, these are infrastructure bonds, um, um, you know, uh, that, uh, that will be issued. So we need to scale up the use of infrastructure bonds. Um, we used to scale up project tied um, loans. Um, you know, that way you uh, ensure that. Um, the debt service to revenue ratio, which is real, the real burden on, uh, you know, that we have in this country is um, reduced. Of course, 23%, uh, 23 uh, about 23% to GDP uh, in terms of debt to GDP ratio, you might say that, we, you know, we, we don't have um, a debt issue, but the real burden is on debt service to revenue. And that debt service to revenue will be uh, addressed if we change our approach to borrowing. So rather than continue to issue uh, FGM bonds, uh, general obligation bonds that are not tied to specific projects, I think we should learn to tie uh, uh, um, um, anything we are issuing to particular specific projects. And mm -hmm. again, um, the, what I mentioned earlier, infrastructure debt fund that um, the um, Alaja Tikwa Baka has talked about, these are, um, if you like, uh, funding uh, initiatives or innovative funding schemes that um, the government should um, also look at. Mm -hmm. um, on the issue of exchange rates, um, you recall the recent exchange rate pressure um, we had, forex pressure, um, is as a result of political activities, uh, politicians mm -hmm. mopping up um, uh, funds. And um, I think it's time uh, the central bank, um, you know, should um, revisit this idea of uh, redenominating the Naira. I mm -hmm. think if the Naira is redenominated, um, this idea of currency, currency substitution that we, 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 know we, are, we are being faced with will reduce. Because when you redenominate, re as we try to do during the time of Soludo, I think the time is now you know, ripe for that. What happens is that it makes the Naira portable. So instead of people demanding dollars and um, because of its portability, they now actually use the Naira for whatever they want to uh, transact. So that will reduce the pressure on, on the on, on for, forex, and then the, the also reduce this idea of dollarization of mm. um, the Nigerian economy. Okay, so mm. I think it's time we 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 took we took a second look mm. at um, you know currency redenomination. Okay, um, prof. If you like, some implement some sort of uh, currency reforms. Well, prof, I think we will have to leave it there. Like, you, as you earlier mentioned, there's nothing wrong with being in debt, but putting it to good use is what is most important. Absolutely. Okay, Professor Ucho Waleke, Professor of Capital Market, National State University, many thanks for coming on the program. Thank you very much. My pleasure, Wills. And that's it on Capital Markets. Do join us same time next week. I'm Willie Bong. Thanks for watching.